is if you look at the way he tried to tackle that problem, he attempted to do it dialectically. And the question is why did he attempt to do it dialectically? And this connects through something that goes all the way back to the boys, and it connects through to Fanon. Um, there's several things Sartre did that distinguished him from other philosophers other than Kant, and also a lot of the more influential recent philosophers from Europe. If you look at many of them, they did lip service to race. They, but Sartre was among those who actually took the position that there was racism in France, and not simply anti-Arab racism, but also anti-Black racism. So the fact that he took that position already made him very uh, If you see black intellectuals bring this up, they'll laugh at it. It's considered not only in France, but in Holland, a lot of people are saying that it's very true. And of course, it's already that meant he had a different consciousness than his peers. And if you look throughout his writing, the presence of um, dehumanized populations, populations that are subject to racism, were not again an external or simply an example. They were treated through an understanding of the contradictions manifested. And so that already locates him differently. The other thing is, he also developed a vicarious consciousness that, again, I would argue from his work with Jan. There are people who would, uh, who, in Europe, we know there's a lot of love for, for the music, but not, I don't think many people understood the music. And even if you see where jazz occurs in those days, it's, he understood jazz in terms of its blue sensibility. And by blues, I don't seem to mean an aesthetic one, but I mean the extent to which blues addresses the suffering of life in the form in which the contradictions can manifest themselves in a way that innocence becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you listen to jazz music, this is blues music, for instance, the subject will refer to the self not as a kind of pure, innocent victim, but as, a, as an adult sensibility with responsibilities that may have also played a role in the complex suffering at hand. That meant that Sartre, in a word, understood black suffering. And it's not exclusively black suffering, but yes, Bob Black is part of his stuff. Um, if you look at the way he engages, not only black, but the way he engages struggles in the Algerian, the Algerian struggle, he was dealing with the question of what it is to be in an intersubjective human relationship. Now, the question is why, and how does this relate to the question of ethics? Well, one of the things that Sartre noticed was that one of the consequences of colonialism and of modern racism is a derailment of the relationship of ethical categories to political categories. And this is something Fanon noticed. And that is, you can't have ethical categories unless there's a possibility of reciprocal recognition. There has to be a possibility, in other words, of being able, of, of being able to relate to the other person from, from say, I, how do I see myself in the position of that other person? The problem with racism that, that Sartre and Salam noticed is that it created a category of people to meet people. So that meant that, ultimately, they were in a zone of non-being. That meant that their relationship to what's presented as ethical structures was one in which they were governed by violent structures. Mm -hmm. And so Sartre, as we know, was constantly pointing out the injustice and violence of the system. Now, this comes to the floor in a way that's really striking if we think about something very interesting today. If you go to many universities, you go to many professional schools, you may notice a proliferation of discussion of ethics. Ethics is all over the place, all right? But many of them don't address a very basic problem. And I'll formulate the problem this way. I was at a meeting once where um, there was an, envi an environmental ethicist asking me a question. And, and she basically pushed the position that if people were just more ethical, our environmental problems would be resolved. And I asked her a question. I asked her, what would bother you more? if people thought you were unethical or that you were stupid. And it was very interesting. 
Her immediate response was that it bothered her more to be considered stupid. Now, what happens if you have a structure that makes it stupid to be ethical? You see what I'm getting at? We look with perplexity at the behavior, whether it's from Wall Street or the law firms, or, you know, criminal justice systems, all of them. But we've already set up a system that is rigged intelligent to an ethical behavior. And so one of the things that had to be that that's talked to very seriously is that is part of the dynamic of relationship based on any types of the system. Because in that system, one faces a situation in which the system functioning according to its rules of normal behavior has embedded in it the very dehumanization of that population of people. And so intelligence in that system becomes how does one erase these communities, but SARC did not do that. It's, it's, it's striking if you look at a lot of recent contemporary French intellectuals. Foucault, uh, if you go and look throughout Europe, a lot of these individuals, they go to great length to write out the legitimacy of black points of view. They will prioritize things like Japanese intent victims. They prioritize issues in the Soviet Union. They would prioritize a lot of categories. Even Mark Cooper did this too. But but the uh, you know but the idea that there is a point of suffering that is directly dealing with this very structure of the system would be erased. And what Sartre began to realize was that there were there's a problem of mere translation involved. The traditional class translation structure would say, in order for the intent of the ethical category, you need to write out this external category. But what a lot of blacks realized was that the other category was more than the question of class contradiction. It was about the very conditions through which certain categories of people could appear as people at all. And that kind of, and this is something, by the way, Start to realize not only in terms of the conversations with Sanam, but he knew this before. And it's interesting to look at the conversations with Richard Wright. Because, you know, Richard Wright, in his discussion of David Thomas and his discussion of Cross Name and the Outsider, were all, were, were, he was bringing out this problem, which we can call the problem of double consciousness. The problem of double consciousness raised two dialectical movements. The first, is a realization that you only see yourself through hostile eyes, the eyes that construct you as negation. And Sartre took that up in, in what was transcendent and had ten lines in Jews. But he's really basing it on the question of the Negro question, the Jewish question. Right? The thing is, there's a second movement, and it's very interesting that Sartre actually moved to that second movement. The second movement is when you realize that you're seeing exclusively through those hostile eyes. If you assert your humanity as legitimate, it means you have to question the system that constructs the you as illegitimate, which means you have to address the contradictions of that system, which is the very definition of a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. That meant that in his formulation to that second movement that linked him intellectually all the way through to individuals, not only Espinal, but also C.L.R. James, all the way through to Antonia Fairman, all the way through to the Haitian Revolution. Because in, in that second movement, which requires systemic critique, it was recognized that a systemic critique can be done from the upsurge of a black body. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that I think is, 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 is a theoretical formulation. But what was interesting about it was the thought it wasn't merely intellectual. It was that a lived reality in terms of the people he worked with, the fact that he would, could be counted on to engage, and the fact that he never patronized the black intellectuals he worked with. He would stay in his position, they would argue with them, and he would change his mind. In other words, he was really speaking as truthfully as he could. That's why, by the way, my, one, of, one of the canon I would love to have, I would have loved to have had a cup of coffee with him, because I knew he would have wanted to, you see? 
And that's a big difference. 